Good evening to everyone. And um, I have a special honor to introduce a very special human being and a great American. Brigadier General John Adams is someone that I have met back in the early 2000s, and it was the time of the post 9-11 when I was uh, head of North America and department in Zagreb, freshly out, you know, just after finishing my post in uh, New York at the United Nations. And he was serving at the office of the Secretary of Defense. And of course, he was right there <laughs> when it happened and assisted, you know, on the crash site. And, uh, and that's something that I think this in pretty much, you know, describes John. He would be where the action is and where, where he's needed to apply his knowledge, his skills, and his heart. You have probably saw his bio. It's quite impressive. He has a master's degrees in international relations, English and strategic studies. He has also served as a faculty member teaching English at the US Military Academy at the West Point. He's a veteran of a number of um, operations, including Desert Storm and Guardian Assistance in Rwanda. He served throughout the Balkans in the 90s. He was also stationed in Brussels, uh, two tours of duty uh, in, uh, for nine years. Um, he is uh, decorated a number of times, um, twice with Defense Superior Service Medal, the Bronze Star, as well as uh, his recipient of the Director of Center of Intelligence Exceptional Human Intelligence Collector Award. Since retiring from active duty in 2007, the General has taken up a number of noble and very useful causes, including a very diligent um, monitoring and um, investigation and uh, documenting the uh, industrial United States uh, defense industrial base and, and trying to see where the vulnerabilities are strategically and particularly when it comes to the defense supply chains from China and some other foreign actors. So uh, he have penned um, a, a really quite a volume, 330 long page study on remaking, Amer titled Remaking American Security that was in 2013, published by the Alliance for American Manufacturing. This is a gentleman who takes everything seriously, from cooking, to sailing, to languages, to getting to know the countries, and someone who grows on you. I hope he will grow on you all. And with this, and no further ado, I give you General John Adams. Thanks, thanks, Yelena. This, this issue, the South China Sea, is, is and should be concerning to us, but we're going to get through it. We're going to be okay. Um, we're going to keep it in perspective. We're going to do what Americans have done for the last 150 years, which is work hard to ensure peace, stability, and global prosperity, which is to our benefit as well as our neighbor's benefit. If we keep our eyes focused on that, we're going to get through this just fine. Uh, you may have heard uh, there was an article in uh, Global Times, which is the Chinese state English language publication, just last week. And I won't read the whole article, but I will read what I think is the most pithy statement. The South China Sea is not the Caribbean. Now, you can take that two ways. One way would be it's provocative, like they're trying to teach us something, like they're trying to poke us a little bit. I prefer to take it as a statement of fact. 
which we all should appreciate. Facts are good. So as long as we can keep our dialogue based on facts, even if they're a little bit controversial, we'll be just fine. Now, why should we care about the South China Sea? Uh, we're going to talk about that. I, I think most of us have a, a pretty good idea. because we, we're, You're here because you care about current events and you care about the world, um, and I, uh, I, I share that. Uh, so we know that there's issues in the South China Sea that we need to be aware of because they affect us all and they affect the world. But we'll talk about what are the, what are the things that really matter in the South China Sea. And it's not, and I'm a, I'm an, I'm a soldier, so I have a, ba a military background, but it's not just a military issue. It's also, a, there's a, it's a complex issue, and I want to try to explain a little bit of that. We'll talk about the competing claims uh, we'll talk about Chinese strategy, and we'll also talk about U.S. strategy, and what, what do we mean by its clashing. Um, and then we'll look at regional players and try to give a little outlook for the future. Um, this would be attractive in my living room if I could take the script off. Uh, because I like the colors, uh, I like the shapes, they're sort of random, but they're not really random, are they? That's a map of the Strait of Malacca, uh, which, and it's right here. It's a 500-mile-long strait that goes between the Indonesian island of Sumatra and the Malaysian peninsula, 500 miles long that carries, and this is really remarkable, it carries a third of world trade every year, $5 trillion worth. Why is that important to the United States? 1.3 million, or trillion of that, is our trade. So on the other side of the world, this 500-mile-long straight between Indonesia and Malaysia carries a third of our, a third of the world trade and a, and a third of that is ours. Um, there's something we should mention, it, the, the, uh, the, the least draft in that 500 mile long straight is 82 feet. There are very large crude carriers, cr ships that carry oil that transit this area, they can't go through that because their draft is too much. They call the the maximum ship that can go through, through there is called the Malacca Max. So the ships that have to go around have to go completely around Sumatra, which is, a, as you can see, a very long island. And so it, time is money in shipping, and that's a big expense. So just to give you an idea, uh, over 10, 10 million barrels of crude oil a day are shipped through there. Um, it's the second most used sea lane in the world. Um, and, it all, and it spills out into the South China Sea the sea that we're talking about. Why is that important? Um, it would be important if only the fact that most, such a high proportion of world trade goes through there. Countries that are not on this part of the world, that are not in this region, like us, like Canada, like every country in the world, have to be concerned about it because so much trade goes through there. But there's some other reasons too. Um, the South China Sea has proven oil reserves of about 7.7 .7 billion barrels with probable reserves greater than 50% likelihood of being exploited of 28 billion barrels. And then just to compare that, it's 25, million, 25 billion is the U.S. proven reserves, and the, the world leader, Venezuela, has 296 billion barrels of proven reserves. Natural gas reserves, again, something essential to our economy. Estimated to total around 266 trillion cubic feet of discovered and undiscovered resources. The U.S., by comparison, has 334. Russia, the world leader, has 1,688. Something that I didn't know before I started doing some research on this topic is the importance of the biodiversity in the South China Sea. Uh, as a study made by the Philippines government, the South China Sea holds one-third of the entire world's marine biodiversity. Now, maybe some of you in the room have saltwater aquariums. I'm from Florida, I have a saltwater aquarium. It's not my backyard, I do have a beach, but I have a saltwater aquarium, and my yellow tang comes from the South China Sea. So I care about my yellow tang's family, and all the other, other biodiversity items that are animals and fish that come out of the South China Sea, and we should care too, because it's ecology. The interest of the nation in the, regions, in the region um, is, of course, it's trade, of course, it's fishing, of course, it's natural resources. 
strategic control of this vital shipping lane in the world is something that's important to every regional country and important to the rest of the world. And most countries in the world watch this from afar as we do with great concern that something could happen to set off a tinderbox. Let's talk about the significance for China itself. Uh, China has 80% of its energy imports come through the Strait of Malacca and then through the South China Sea. They get about 40% of their oil, their energy from the Middle East, and about 40% from Africa. So all of that comes through there. Um, the Chinese economy absolutely depends on access through the South China Sea, and so that drives their strategy understandably. What's the significance for the United States? Well, quite aside from the trade that I've talked about and the fact that my yellow tang comes from the South China Sea, um, we are concerned about how do we exercise global leadership in this world, and the South China Sea is a major test for how we're going to execute our global leadership. Do we want to be a global leader? I would argue we do. I would argue that the United States has been a force for global leadership for decades now, and if we renege on that, uh, there's going to be some serious problems in the rest of the world, not just for us. Let's look at the competing claims on a map. And the reason I like this map is one, it's the one you have, so you're welcome. Um, it's a, it is a, uh, a map of the varying claims, and the most significant from our perspective looking at strategies is the nine dash line, which is what China claims as its territorial sea. Taiwan claims it as well. Their claims parallel China's. Um, their claim to the nine dash line to 90% of the South China Sea dates from the 15th century Ming Dynasty. And the Chinese admiral uh, named Zhang He, who had a fleet of merchant vessels that literally explored the world. There's some evidence that Zhang He, in the 15th century, beat Columbus to the New World. Uh, I think that's going to be an exciting process of discovery itself. Archaeology is working hard on it. But suffice it to say, Zhang He and his merchant fleets were all over the Pacific. And this is one of the areas that they spent the most time because it's close to China. China considered that part of its territory, territorial sea. Um, that, of course, contradicts the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which was actually codified in 1982 and finally published and went into effect in 1994, which talks, and, and I'll, I'll simplify it, but there is, there is obviously a lot to this, you know, dozens and dozens of pages of, with many articles. But the, the core of it is it establishes rules for who has what part of the sea and what does that mean for their territory and their sovereignty. The basic, uh, the basic numbers to remember are 12 nautical miles around every country's coast, is the territorial sea within which they have sovereignty. So that belongs to them. They can control access to it. They can control the extraction of natural resources, fish, gas, oil, whatever. Uh, it belongs to them. Then there's the 12 nautical mile contiguous zone, which lies just outside the 12 mile territorial sea. And in the contiguous zone, there can be transit, but only with the permission of the country which controls the contiguous zone. So somewhat less control. And still the country has to give permission for any extraction of resources from that 12-mile contiguous zone. The third is, and that's what's reflected on this map. I guess the map is just too small a scale to show the 12 miles. But you get an idea here of where the zones of dispute are uh, for the countries in the region. The blue line indicates the economic exclusion zone, within which the country has the right to have extraction from that area. And uh, other countries, again, have to ask permission to transit it, or not to transit it, but to, to use anything, to do anything, whether it be, uh, again, extraction of natural resources or uh, fishing or, or whatever it might be. So th you can see how that completely overlaps the nine dash line. That's the source of the dispute here. And it's, it's uh, something that is completely separate from the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, I'd like to point out the three major island groupings uh, in the South China Sea. One is the Paracels here. Uh, then there's the Spratleys, a much larger collection of islands, but also atolls and reefs 
and then Scarborough Shoal, which is relatively small, but particularly significant because it's right off the coast of the Philippines, and there's been a lot of tension in that area. The Paracels have been under disputed Vietnamese-Chinese control for hundreds of years uh, because of its, its proximity to Vietnam and China. But in 1974, uh, both countries came to blows uh, when the, the government of then South Vietnam and China fought a naval clash there, which resulted in the deaths of 18 Chinese and 53 Vietnamese military. Uh, since then, China uh, concluded that that, squat, that uh, clash by actually seizing the Paracels, and they're now in control of it. Um, there was a standoff in uh, 2014 when a Chinese oil rig, Chinese government oil rig, uh, just started the exploration for oil deposits in the Paracels, and Vietnam, uh, they addressed it with a, a standoff, basically. They sent uh, naval units there to try to prevent the platform from locating itself effectively, and the Chinese stopped the drilling activity after only a month and a half. Um, who knows whether that's still out there, but it was certainly the case that the Chinese were trying to press their claim to natural resources. The Spratly Islands here um, are disputed by the Philippines and Malaysia, China, and Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan actually has an island here that they've occupied for a generation now. Um, and there's no indication that they're going to do anything except continue to occupy it. That's the Republic of China, Taiwan. Uh, the, the Philippines, uh, Malaysia, uh, Vietnam, and China all occupy various islands within there. And there's no real tourist value to them uh, because they're either small islands or they're just too far away for tourists to go. But they are uh, building structures there and because there's no tourists, the structures would only have one purpose, and that is to militarize the islands and the atolls. In March 1988, there was a skirmish between China and Vietnam that killed more than 70 Vietnam, Vietnamese military uh, on one of the islands here, Johnson South Reef, which is approximately there. Uh, China deployed troops to, the, to many of the unoccupied reefs following that, um, and they have taken over most of the reefs and the islands there. Uh, Scarborough Shoal, uh, here, again, was a site of a uh, conflict between Philippine military and Chinese fishermen in 2012, um, which both the Philippine military and the Chinese military sent reinforcements to, and it got really uh, tenuous. There, were, there was no loss of life. There was some destruction of property. Uh, the Philippines appealed at that time uh, as a signatory to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. They appealed to the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea in 2013, a case which China didn't recognize. China has, although it's a signatory to the UNCLOS, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, China does, did not recognize that particular petition from Philippines. And when the International Tribunal on Law of the Sea came back with its uh, decision that the Philippines was right to assert claim to its exclusive economic zone in Scarborough Shoal, China disregarded and denied that it was of any importance. Interestingly enough, when the International Tribunal came back with its decision, they did not directly address the Chinese claim to the Nine Dash Line. They, just, they simply said that it was irrelevant because it doesn't have any relevance in the, in the, the rule-based uh, decisions of the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. China prefers to resolve claims bilaterally with the countries, and they've had some success with that. Um, one of the examples is uh, with the Scarborough Shoal, although there is this dispute that the Philippines had with China over Scarborough Shoal, um, President Duterte, one of his first moves uh, in, this, in this particular issue was to negotiate bilateral with China to allow Philippine fishermen to go to Scarborough Shoal. Now, we can see that, again, a glass half empty, glass half full. On the one hand, uh, President Duterte from the Philippines is... Uh, perhaps using that as a way to break away from his uh, commitment as a U.S. ally in the Philippine-U.S. mutual defense agreement. Uh, on the other hand, um, maybe it lowers the tensions, and it's certainly beneficial to the Philippine fishermen. Most countries in the region prefer to deal with the, the issue multilateral, multilaterally. Um, 
the U.S. is officially neutral on that, but I think uh, one of the most important outcomes might, would be uh, to look at this as a multilateral negotiation. Because what happens when you have countries in a multilateral discussion? They sit down, they may disagree, and they talk, and they talk, and they talk. And you don't have a war, and you have a long period of time where you can continue economic relationships, which, again, build confidence, build peace. So I think the best way to do this uh, would be to uh, come, come up with some sort of multilateral discussion on this. I do think it's important for us to look at the goal or the roles of Chinese strategy in the South China Sea. Um, students of Chinese history will know quite well that um, China, as I said, Admiral Zhang He had this empire in Asia during the 15th century Ming Dynasty. And from that time until 1840, China became the number, it was number three in gross domestic product in the world. Now, one could ask, one could ask what, is, what is the role of gross domestic product in assessing value and wealth in the 19th century? And I, I think that's a reasonable question. Um, but, but be that as it may, China was a very wealthy country uh, and had very, had very great assets and a lot of production, and certainly they were one of the most important economic powers in the world until 1840. And in 1840, uh, our friends, the British government, decided they would wage war over the op opium trade in China, and that began a run on China by many European colon colonial powers that eventually divested China of its wealth by the beginning of the 20th century. If that wasn't bad enough, if that didn't produce enough ire, then Japan uh, invaded China in the 1930s and 40s and killed millions of people. And what wealth was left was taken back to Japan. China has never forgotten this. I mean, we, for us, uh, I, a most recent searing experience for those of us whose parents may have fought in World War II or one of the other wars since then, we don't forget that. We don't, we don't forget that. That's important. China doesn't forget World War II and what Japan did to it. It's searing for them, understandably. They call it 100 years of humili humiliation between 1840 and 1945. And then they had a civil war after that where they fought the, the, the communist Chinese, fought the nationalist Chinese, and established the Republic of China and Taiwan. A hundred years of hum humiliation is the impetus for a defense strategy in their minds. We could, we could maybe look at it another way, but they call it defense because what they're trying to do is prevent other powers from ever taking over China again. So they feel like what they need to do is uh, use, in this case, uh, geography as a way to counter any potential invasion. Um, the two lines of defense against the United States in Chinese strategy are the first island chain and the second island chain. The first island chain indicated, and I should mention, this is ironic, but the term first and second island chain actually originated with our Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, in 1951. And we looked at it as an offensive, offensive lines trying to counter the Soviet Union in that time the Korean War, right after World War II, um, ah, makes strategic sense. But China has turned it around, and they say, well, the Americans were going to come after the Soviet Union, and coincidentally China, because it wasn't a world power at the time. But they look at it as a way to, uh, as a goal, to keep American offensive weapons out of China, off China's coast, so that they can't uh, interdict their sea, uh, their, their, their trade, uh, and hurt all the valuable cities and installations here along the uh, Pacific coast. First island chain uh, goal is to keep the U.S. and other potentially uh, inter invading powers out. The second island chain is even further out, and what's significant about the second island chain is, again, if, if China is looking at America as their major potential adversary, we have major bases here in, J in Japan, and we have a major base in Guam. So they look at those two island chains and then see that as a way to posture themselves to successfully counter intervention by the United States. China's developed what they call uh, a maritime-based strategy called the offshore defense strategy. And a major advocate for that is this gentleman here, Admiral Liu Huaqing, uh, who actually began his service uh, 
uh, I'm proud to say as a ground forces officer, as a, as a, as a soldier, uh, fought in, fought in uh, World War II against the Japanese, fought against the Kuomintang in the late 1940s, uh, and then decided, I don't know what came in his mind, decided he was going to become a sailor in his mid-30s. Who would do that? I, I can't believe that. But he did. And so he became China, the leader of Chinese Navy in the next 20 years. His first job was as research and development chief for China's Navy. That's another thing. In China, they call the Navy the People's Liberation Army Navy. I find that very confusing. Um, but that's what they call it. Um, Li, Liu Wacheng, Liu, uh, was a genius. He was a naval architect. He, was a, he understood technology, and he invested in the right people and the right systems to make China's Navy something that could actually project power. He was the real architect of China's plan to build aircraft carriers, which is only now, uh, he died in 1994, only now becoming a reality. They have one small aircraft carrier. It's really low capability, but it's a test bed. They're building three large carriers, which probably won't be as sophisticated as ours, but they're on their way. And that is the inspiration of Liu Huaqing. He also revolutionized development of China's uh, ship to air missiles and China's surface to air missiles and China's long range ballistic missile program. All of those came not from his brain personally, but from the teams he assembled around him to look at how can China project power? What do we have to do? Um, the goal, exert control over the first maritime ch island chain uh, by 2000. I'd say they're late for that because they don't have it yet, but they're moving. Exert control over maritime territory within the second island chain by 2020. I think they're behind schedule on that too, but again, they're still moving with their plan. And three, project maritime power globally by 2050, and that's a ways from now. They have decided that a key component of the offshore defense strategy is to militarize the South China Sea. And they do that with, in these ways. Uh, one, uh, as you can see, and I'll go, I'll go to a slide here because I think it's probably more useful. They will, what they do is they uh, look for uh, islands or atolls that can be militarized, can be built up so that they become mini uh, island aircraft carriers. Um, they build enhanced air defense capabilities, airfields and amphibious capabilities. They've even constructed some mobile nuclear reactors, which are very handy uh, for islands because they provide long-term long power uh, without having to bring in oil. Um, they use the South China Sea for patrols of their growing ballistic missile submarine fleet. Uh, and they have, uh, they have some low capability ballistic missile submarines now that cannot range the United States, but they're fielding missiles uh, that can. And uh, it's projected that within the next five to 10 years, they'll have ballistic missile submarines that can range the entire North American continent. Um, the South China Sea happens to be a good place for submarines to patrol. It's a combination of low, of, of shallow water and very deep water, um, which is good to evade sonar. They, they, the militarized South China Sea islands can, can be a good base for low intensity military operations, and they ultimately ensure a very capable anti access and area denial capacity. I think this next map or this next video is not a video, but image is great. This is what Fiery Cross Reef in the Spratly Islands looked like in August 14, 2014. You can see there's mostly water. The, it looks like a great place to scuba, but it's, but it's going to change right now. Look at that. That's what it looked like less than two years later. They had built this on that little reef. Now, they did that by dredging up soil, sea, sea soil with, from the deep water around it and piling it on top of all that beautiful coral and all those beautiful biomes there. Uh, they constructed a 10,000... Uh, foot runway, which can land anything. I mean, think O'Hare, uh, think Dulles. Um, any Chinese civilian or, more important, what are civilians going to do there? Um, except just go and come back. But they, th this 10,000-foot runway is, has been replicated at 10 other sites in the South China Sea. Not Some on the artificial islands, but some on 
islands in the Paracels that are real islands that already were islands. Interestingly enough, uh, and this is two years old, but just in November last year, uh, we got some unclassified imagery, and you can find it too on the uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies website, unclassified imagery of what they're doing on the island with air defense sites. There's, a, there's an air defense revetment there. There's one here. There's one here. And there's one here. And those are significant because they, they are the kind of shelters for air defense sites that are the same as for other SA-9 Chinese air defense missiles with a range of 250 nautical miles, capable of shooting down anything we've got and capable of firing against cruise missiles. So very good defensive capability, uh, long-staying power. Not all of these have the, the nuclear power uh, installed yet, but that's in the future. And ability to reinforce with aircraft. Um, and on some of the island, uh, the island north of the South China Sea, Hainan Island, they built submarine pens, which allow submarines to go inside the, the, the land and protect themselves uh, both from blast and, and visibility. Is this offensive or defensive? Chinese say it's defensive. Uh, we, we see it as a, a, as a problem, and the other countries with a claim in the region see it as a problem as well. All that being said, let me come back to keeping this in context. And that's exactly the most important thing I think we as citizens can do. Be concerned, take note, understand the facts, but then put it in perspective. This is one aspect of an important, complex US-China relationship. Um, it's important for us to think about how to manage this as opposed to how to solve it. We will be unable to solve this in the short term. Maybe never. Do we want to avoid disruption of commerce by any kind of either inadvertent or planned activities, especially military? Absolutely, because again, so much trade goes through there that it would hurt us too. Does China want to disrupt commerce? No, they don't. They want their economy to continue to grow. So there's real danger here in allowing it to become out of context and taking taking extreme actions when really we have to, to manage this. So what are the US policy objectives in the South China Sea? We talk a lot about freedom of navigation. It is both a term of art and actually uh, an operation that the United States Navy conducts. Planned, in a, in a, in a planned by the State Department and then, and then operated by the Department of Defense. And we conduct freedom of navigation ops all the time. I mean, not every day, but I mean, it's a, it's a regular action that we conduct. When I was in Office of Secretary of Defense, I would work with uh, the office that would do the freedom of navigation operations. I thought it was pretty, pretty interesting to understand how the process works. They're planned, in, planned weeks in advance. They're executed exa exactly as they should be, very stringently and rigorously. And they're designed to show the countries of the region that we're going we're gonna to follow the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, and I'll, I'll, perhaps we'll have time to talk about why the United States has not yet ratified the UN Convention on Law to see, but we certainly conduct our operations in accordance with it. We like rules. Um, there's, even as uh, we do that, and I mentioned that we're, our, our US foreign policy has been doing this well for decades, we want to produce the potential for conflict. Um, as we conduct maritime and air patrols, we're not looking for things that we can do to spark conflict. We're looking for ways that we can demonstrate that we and other countries in the world can transit these areas according to the rules and not conduct uh, military uh, provocation. So we discourage militarization. We have explicitly condemned land reclamation and, create, and essentially the the attempt to create new economic exclusion zones, because that's what the Chinese appear to try to be doing. We take no position on the competing claims. We've never told Philippines, we agree with your claim, uh, or told Malaysia, we agree with your claim, or told China that we agree with your claim. We've, take, we've taken no position on that, except to say we don't believe that we should be using force to resolve it. Um, we have a policy also uh, of uh, non-involvement on whether it should be multilateral or bilateral. We, we just want to encourage some sort of attempt to resolve. An important, uh, important consideration here is the importance of China, South China Sea for ballistic missile submarine operations. And uh, we know that the 
Chinese ballistic missile submarine fleet, uh, no more than four, four boats right now, uh, but they're, planning, they're building more and they're building more advanced boats. Um, their main port is in Hainan Island, and we'll go back and show you where that is. Hainan Island is right there. So the, the Long Po, which is their, uh, their, their nuclear submarine fleet, is on the, the southeast corner of Hainan Island. And they've got, that's where they've got the sub pens. So we know that's where they, 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 they go to, to replenish themselves. But their, their main patrol area is the South China Sea. Remember the drone that was seized uh, in December? You all probably read about that in the paper. What was that drone doing? Well, I don't know. Uh, and I, if I knew, I wouldn't be talking about it. But since I don't know, I can speculate that one of the things they're doing is they're looking at the, the, sea, uh, the, 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 the sea shelf. And probably one of the reasons they were doing that is to map it. And it, it seems like a pretty random place to, to put a, a, a civilian, government civilian drone to map. Um, I suspect that it has something to do with our, our, our desire to, to know the terrains because that's where Chinese subs operate. Makes sense to me. Again, I don't know. If I did, I wouldn't talk about it. But I don't know. Um, they, the, the danger is that they can continue to develop their fleet, consolidate control over the South China Sea, and have a very safe place to patrol. Um, our, our boats patrol all over the world. Uh, we have 14 uh, nuclear uh, ballistic missile nuclear submarines that are some of them are out at any one time, uh, but they control anywhere. The Chinese, they can't because they don't have the, the, the legs to go out that far, and because they're very noisy, and a detected uh, nuclear ballistic missile nuclear submarine is, is pretty useless because once it's detected, you can sink it. Um, so very important for their strategy that they control the sea. How are we doing on time? Okay. Um, A couple things I want to say about U.S. strategy that I think are important, and then I'll go to questions. Um, if you're just, just looking at this as a, as a military problem, which I suggest is a, a mistake, um, you can see, and it's off-cited, that the United States has more defense spending than the other 10 countries of the world combined. True statement. However, uh, if we're going to be uh, a global leader in ensuring peace and security, uh, we need to have a military that can project itself for good, for prosperity, for peace. Uh, so I think it's a mistake to go immediately to uh, this particular statistic as, a, as anything that's going to speak to this problem. Uh, I do think it's good to look at the uh, regional players and what their positions are. Uh, again, all of them have interests and claims in the region. Uh, Vietnam, with their, with their conflict in the past with China, has very high stakes. Uh, they, they're, they're hard over on their claim, uh, and they're not backing down at all. The Philippines talked a little bit about their claim. Uh, interesting to note and to remember that we have a formal military, our mutual defense treaty with the Philippines, an attack. We have to support them. Obviously, we don't want our, our good neighbors, the Philippines, the, the Filipinos, to attack China that would then draw us into a conflict. So we want to encourage responsible behavior on their part. Taiwan, they have their own issues vis-a-vis -vis China, but they have essentially the same claim to the South China Sea as the, as the People's Republic of China. Malaysia's actually taken a very um, st strong uh, attempt to try to negotiate with China. Um, and I, I would say that's a good thing. Um, Brunei has its own claims, very small cl country, very small claims, and they've taken a relatively low profile in this. Uh, Indonesia has an interesting role. Um, big country, uh, what, 200 million people, uh, a very powerful military, and getting stronger. Uh, over the weekend, you may have seen that the president of uh, Indonesia, uh, Widodo, went to Australia for a state visit, and one of the important uh, subjects they discussed was Indonesia's proposal for joint uh, Philippine, or joint uh, Indonesian-Australian patrols in the South China Sea. Uh, Australia... They, did, they, they demurred. They decided they weren't going to you know, sign up for that. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion in, in, uh, in Australian news about uh, how they're trying to figure out how to, they don't want to just dis, 
disrespect uh, the, the Indonesians, but on the other hand, if they send their ships on joint patrols with Indonesia through the South China Sea, uh, they, they're, they're thinking, uh, their defense thinking is maybe that's too provocative. Uh, up, there, up to them, but I think the U.S. would agree with that thought process. Um, linkage, I think it's important. Uh, we talked about trade and the, in the, the interdependent markets. Interdependent being there are parts that go into other larger end items. Uh, so many of them are made in some of the countries around the South China Sea. Uh, disruption of trade not only disrupts the end item production, it disrupts the interdependent parts that go into those end items. So it's a very complicated market. Um, how does this affect what's going on in North Korea? And, and one could argue, how could it? Of course it does. Our relationship with China is, is hugely important for their relationship with North Korea and the kind of impact their relationship on North Korea can have, be positively or negatively. So this is all part of the equation, and I don't think we can forget that. Uh, Japan has its separate issues with China. You're probably familiar with the, uh, the disputes in the East China Sea over what the, what the Chinese call the Diaoyu Islands and what the Japanese call the Senkaku Islands. And they've had their own, uh, there, there's not been any deaths, but there's certainly been a lot of close air passes and uh, a lot of belligerent behavior uh, over the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands. And, and so Japan and China are in their own dialogue. Chi Japan is a very close U.S. ally, and they've largely taken a position supportive of ours, which is not to, the, not to take a part in the dispute, but to discourage building of these new, uh, these new islands. And cyber warfare, uh, we all know that the Chinese are doing to us what we're doing to them. And the limit is who knows. But we've got to think about the impact of a more provocative uh, stance toward China, we think about what they can do to us in cyber warfare as well. Outlook, I like this. Um, do we want to have uh, Chinese amphibious forces hitting the, hitting the beach on uh, South China Sea islands and reefs, or maybe even other countries, uh, or do we want to have trade? Um, I think the, pr the question is pretty clear for me. Let, me. let me stop before questions and say there's three things I think we ought to remember. One, um, I talked about principle at the beginning. Uh, we're committed to uh, global peace, prosperity, and security, and that is, ha has been a very successful foreign policy for us and security policy for us for decades now. Um, I suggest we stay focused on that. That's a principle that is, that's been very valuable. Um, perspective, talked about that, because if we keep this in perspective, we'll realize it's connected to everything else, and if we allow ourselves to be taking a, sto a soda straw view of the South China Sea issue, we're going to miss the context, which is more important. Um, and, and finally, predictability. There's been a lot of discussion of predictability in the last couple months. I, you know, I, I won't go into the details of that. I think you know what I'm talking about. But if you're going to build a successful relationship with another country, whether they're your closest friend or a potential adversary, there's got to be some element of trust as a kernel on which you can build. And if you don't act predictably, if you don't speak predictably, if you don't encourage the other side, your interlocutor, to at least believe that what you say you really mean, you're not going to have any progress in the relationship. And I think we Americans uh, can take some value from that. And when we talk to China about our policies or about their policies, we've got to give them the idea that we know what we're talking about. We're going to stay focused on what's good for both countries. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to advance our own interests, clearly, and we must. But we've got to be predictable in how we behave. We've got serious interests in preserving peace in this region, uh, not only for us, but our allies, too. If we're capable and careful and we follow these three Ps, perspective, predictability, and most important principle uh, will come out on the other side much better off than uh, we would be if, some, if something uh, let's sets off this tinderbox. So I'll stop there. Um, I will tell you there's one question that you can ask it if you want, but I don't have an answer. Uh, a a well-informed gentleman asked a very good question today. I spoke at Hope College, and he said, can you tell me what the operational depth of U.S. and Chinese nuclear ballistic missile submarines is? I, I, I wouldn't answer that. So I haven't spent any time this afternoon trying to find out the answer to that. Uh, it's a great question, but I suggest that we probably don't want to talk about that here tonight. 
So I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to your questions, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, General Adams, and uh, yes, uh, if we knew, then maybe we would have to be killed, so <laughs> better not to know. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have uh, the phone number for texting in your questions, but we also invite audience members to come down to either one of the microphones um, to ask questions of General Adams. Um, I do have a question that was sent um, to me as you were speaking, um, and that's really, even though it sounds like um, Militarizing from a U.S. perspective is not what you would recommend. Um, tactically, is that something that we would be capable of doing um, as uh, if we were to defend our allies in the region or, um, you know, if things were to become more complicated? I think probably there are war games being played at the Pentagon like every week right now. Uh, and they, l they look at a range of options from severe to uh, most severe um, we we have the capability to destroy Chinese Navy and Air Force pretty quickly, um, but the result then would be the interruption of trade for an interminable period of time. Now who wins with that? In a conflict, both sides lose. Um, do we have the military capability, and uh, will we have it for the next five to ten years? Probably. But I can tell you that one of the... Chinese elements of their strategy is a, is, a, uh, is a strategy where they identify industries, technologies, what they call our strategic emerging industries, and they've identified 32 of them, uh, which they believe will give them the technological high ground in a potential conflict, in which they have assiduously uh, cultivated and developed since the late 1980s and have a dominating role in several of them. One of them is rare earths that I think you are probably familiar with. Uh, China controls 90% of the world's market in rare earths. We control 2%. Um, rare earths are important. Every single electronic device in the world has a very small but very critical element of rare earths. It'd be like, it'd be like taking potassium out of our bodies. How much potassium do we have? That's pretty small. But you got to have it or you die. And rare earths are like that too. And there's, there's there's 19 rare earths, and they're all uh, of very relative importance. Uh, China's also uh, been assiduous about cultivating uh, strength in the semiconductors market. Uh, another important technology for our defense, every electronic device, not every, but most electronic devices have semiconductors. And there are others. I could go through that. That was the, really the, the subject of the book that I wrote, Remaking American Security, and how I got interested in this problem. Um, so... The answer to the question is really uh, not only is it uh, a matter of relative military power, because there, there are ways to measure that, but what are, what are the keys to victory? For the United States, the key to victory on the battlefield, the key to remaining uh, unassailable on the battlefield has been uh, control of technologies that, that enable us to win, and we're losing that. So the trend is concerning to me, for sure. Thanks for the question. Yeah, hi. I have a question about the um, something you said on one of your slides. Let's see. The U.S. takes no position on competing claims, and yet, unless I'm misreading the map, it seems like the com it's definitely that the United States is not making not taking an issue on competing claims, but uh, and the United States hasn't ratified the UN uh, Law of the Sea, but we follow it. You also said. But it seems like China's nine-dash line is way outside its exclusive economic zone and clearly inside of the economic zone of the Philippines and some of those other places. So by not saying something or by not telling China they have to follow the law of the sea, we are really taking a side, aren't we? And we do that. I, I was in, I was, if I conveyed that we weren't taking a position on China's historic claim as opposed to the rules of the UN Convention on Law to see that's not accurate. Now we do, we, what, I, what, I sh what I want to clarify is to say that we take no p position on Philippines claim versus the legitimate claim of Brunei or Malaysia or Vietnam. Uh, and we don't take a, we wouldn't argue with China's claim to its own legitimate exclusive economic zone 
according to the rules of the law of the sea. We, we, we simply don't, like, much like the, the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, we, we believe it's irrelevant. The nine dash line. Correct. Right. So we would. So when you say that the United States takes no position on competing claims between two legitimate complaints. Correct. Claims, but we would tell China that the nine dash line is illegitimate. You know, I don't <laughs> know whether we would say that explicitly, but you, you can take that by exception. Uh, we're we we are. I think doing. Uh, I think we're we're being very careful how we express it. Uh, you know, I don't speak in case you question whether I speak for the government of the United States or not. I clearly do not. Uh, I'm an American, but I'll let the White House speak for the, for the United States government. But, but I do think, though, that our government, both the previous administration and this one, has been judicious in not uh, trying to address the claims per se and s simply uh, urging others to respect the territorial sea, contiguous zone, and <coughs> EEZs that all countries have and to respect the right of all countries to uh, transit those zones according to the rules of the UN Convention of Law of the Sea. But it brings up another issue which I think is very important. Um, and when we say freedom of navigation is important and agree with other countries that it's important and, and support other countries' execution of freedom of navigation, whether it be on, on the sea, under the sea, or in the air, we believe that applies to both civilian and military vessels. China does not. They believe that transit only applies uh, to civilian vessels and that military vessels should uh, duly ask permission. Um, the same, I, I think I mentioned the same day or the day of when they published the article asking for public comment about uh, whether, uh, did, I, did I talk about the public comment in this forum? I don't think I did. So last week when the Global Times came out, uh, there was another publication in China which pertains to their rules for maritime traffic in China's uh, maritime waters. And the proposal is soliciting public comment on a potential new rule that would require all vessels coming into Chinese territorial waters to uh, request, whether it be EEZ or contiguous or, or territorial, to request permission to enter. And if they do enter, uh, to announce themselves. Aircraft have to announce themselves. Uh, Ships on the, on the surface have to fly their flag and request permission if they're in the EZ. Um, and then ships underwater, and this is where this is a real sticking point. If we send a sub in there, it, then they they'd have to surface and fly a flag. Uh, most subs like to be underwater. There's a reason. Uh, and, and, and so that, that, that would be a hard one for us to accept. So I presume the public comment is on its way. Yeah, hope that answered your question. Yeah, you're welcome. Great question. Please. Thanks so much for coming tonight and sharing your knowledge with us. I have a question about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Okay. I know that TTP, as it was proposed, is now dead, but I can't help but wonder if a multinational trade discussion vehicle, something like that, wouldn't be helpful in engaging all the stakeholders in this region in trying to solve problems peacefully? Great question, and uh, here are my thoughts on that. As uh, much it as it, it would be and is productive for us to have good trade relations with the countries in the region, I think the way that we are going, and, and I happen to agree with it, is to uh, solidify and reinforce our current bilateral trade relationships with the countries of the region. Um, one of the problems with the TPP that I think is a legitimate concern, there's two major problems that I think are important to remember. One is, if we did have the TPP, other countries, in, countries of the region could compete for our defense procurement contracts on, a, on an equal basis. And we would have to come up with another way to try to prevent uh, defense procurement contracts from further flowing uh, offshore. It's already a problem, um, and I think we need to get our hands around it. I don't, we don't now. Uh, I know that the new administration, is, that's one of their major goals. Maybe you read what was going on today. Uh, there's, a lot com there's a lot coming out of the Department of Commerce right now, and will come out in the next week or two. Uh, but one of their major goals is to make sure that we don't lose any more. We have no more offshoring of our critical defense uh, nodes in the defense industrial base. The other problem is that 
right now when there's a trade case, it's adjudicated by our Department of Commerce. If there were a trade case under the TPP, as it was written, it would be adjudicated by an international panel. And I think there was an a, a understandable concern on the part of, uh, of the, both the previous administration, although they ultimately went with TPP, but you remember uh, the Democratic candidate was against it, and that was one of the reasons. Uh, not, a, not a dramatic reason, didn't make a lot of headlines, but, um, but it, that's, really, that's really part of the problem. So those are two things that I think would have been a problem. The one that I think is also a problem, but it wasn't really very public, is um, you know, the, the, the thought behind the TPP when it was first drafted was that this is a way for us to show uh, that we are willing to uh, complete the, or to advance our pivot to Asia by creating uh, a stronger trade relationship with our friends and partners there. Uh, and that China would not be part of it. I think that's disingenuous. Um, China would have come in in the next round, most likely. And then, then not only would we have countries in Southeast Asia uh, or countries in the TPP competing for our defense procurement contracts, we'd have China competing for our defense procure procurement contracts. That, and, and we'd have to appeal to an international panel to, to, uh, to judge that. I, I think that would be unwise. I think we're going to have a stronger net of bilateral trade relationships in the short term, and I think it's probably wise for us to think about how we can make that uh, more of a multilateral body, but we're not there yet. Does that answer your question? Yes. No, thanks for the question. Hi. Hello. Um, I was wondering if we should be worried about um, current tensions between the U.S. and Philippines, and AB kind of speaks specifically about our role on the island of Mindanao in the Philippines. Um, what we're doing there and what that looks like and the tensions between. Well, as you probably know, uh, most of our activities in Mindanao are counter-terrorist activities, mm -hmm. uh, so very strong military activities, working with the Philippine Army uh, and the Philippine police. So, and we've been there for 10 years, and we've always had a close relationship with the Philippines military. Um, when President Duterte sent uh, his envoy to China, to talk with them about the problem in the Scarborough Sound, he sent Fidel Ramos, an interesting fellow, graduate of West Point, a very good friend of many people in the United States military. And that, what that tells me, and I don't know him personally, but I know his history, he's a, he, he's a good man. Um, and, 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 and I think our military has a real strong relationship with him. But our military has a great relationship with the Filipino military. We're having some issues trying to understand President Duterte. Uh, I think maybe President Duterte is having some issues trying to understand our chief, our commander in chief too. Um, but but I, I'll go back to my first statement. I think we're going to get through this, um, and and I think that our relationship, our friendship with the Philippine, with the government of the Philippines, is they're going to have they're going to have new pr presidents. I mean, they one of them was assassinated, you know, 30 years ago. It was a terrible time. We got through it, and I believe that the friendship between our peoples is so strong, and our, our cultural ties, our economic ties, they're massive. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm hopeful that we'll get through this too. But, I mean, it's a great question, and we can't take our eyes off of it, uh, and they shouldn't take our eyes off of us either. But I think if we remember the, 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 sti the, the long-term stability of the relationship, is, I believe we're going to get through this. So that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you for, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, I spent 24 years on active duty, mostly associated with naval aviation, principally carrier aviation. So I have obviously an interest, and a and state. I'm from Pensacola, so I we well, we, we know the same you. skies. You well, you almost made it, yeah. General. <laughs> In any case, uh, this is almost a follow-up on the last question. And that is, uh, I'm going to speak or ask about a relatively recently inaugurated president, not ours, but that of the Philippines, namely President Duarte. He strikes me as being a bit of a, somewhere between a wild weasel, a change agent, and an unpredictable, at least in the conventional sense of history, uh, President, what 
would you speculate on his impact uh, on activities and strategy from various different sides in the South China Sea? Good question. Um, we are trying to figure out President Duterte. Uh, I'm pretty confident that he's trying to figure himself out, too. Uh, he doesn't come from a background of state-level leadership. Um, and so he's, he's, he's acting in a way that he, he's going to have a learning curve. Um, I like the fact that we have this strong history of a great relationship with the Philippines. Fidel Ramos is just a, an example of how important that is. But there are so many others who've been educated in our military schools, who have been educated in our universities. I mean, the, I, have Filipino, I have Filipino relatives. I know how strong the relationship is between us and the Philippines. And it's not going to get weaker, even though President Duterte, Duterte has got this learning curve issue. Uh, so I think we ought to be a combination of uh, patient, but also uh, firm behind the scenes with him uh, about how we can work together to, to actually uh, cultivate a better mutual defense relationship with them. If they're committed to it. We are too. Uh, we don't want them to go off the reservation and attack the Chinese uh, Coast Guard. Uh, we, we like him to do, actually, I think it's encouraging that he sent Ramos to China and came back last year with an agreement that Filipino fishermen can use uh, Scarborough Shoal. That's a step in the right direction, and I, I think we should encourage that. But people are critical of it, like, oh, you're undermining our relationship with China. I don't see it that way, but please. Okay, I'm just going to... Uh push that a touch further. <clears throat> uh, my, my sense is that he uh, surprised perhaps himself, but uh, at least the Philippines and also us and much of the rest of the world with his uh, cozying up to the current uh, president or El Jefe of uh, China. Uh, do you see that as moving forward and increasing the interactions between the Philippines and China economically? You mentioned the uh, fishermen in Scarborough Shoal. I think it could have a positive effect if it lowers tensions. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, I think as an American, I'd like to see a stronger economic relationship between the Philippines and China. They're regional neighbors. Uh, they have uh, a relationship that would be, would be weird if they didn't have a strong relationship. But I, I share concerns of many, both here and in the Philippines. We don't know what's going to happen next with him. So worth keeping an eye on that. And, and again, in a non-confrontational way, uh, as is best done in diplomacy, uh, have uh, frank and productive conversations about what we can do to be better allies. Looking at it as a win-win as opposed to hey, we're going to stick a finger in your eye. Conversations in, between people and countries never start well when you put your finger in somebody's chest. Uh, you can expect there will be a very short conversation. So I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a real believer in doing things as much as we can in a way that doesn't embarrass your interlocutor. Thank you. No, thank you, sir. Good questions. We have time for one more question. So. General, I am a proud uh, dual uh, citizen, Filipino and American. And uh, it's quite interesting that the uh, gentleman brought up uh, President Duterte, uh, very interesting uh, character. He seems to be very sincere in what he's doing, although a little bit unconventional. Uh, my question is, in as much as I'd like to delve into our new president there, uh, I'd like to, uh, um, you mentioned about global leadership and uh, given this uh, seem to be a changing world order wherein uh, China is gaining certain leadership role too in the Asia Pacific region, where do you think, uh, what do you think would be the, dy the new dynamics in terms of uh, global leadership with the United States and China trying to gain more role into this uh, space? Good question. Um, there the, the Chinese see their strategy as defensive. We see elements of offense in it. The worst case for us would be if that were to go into the classic 
security dilemma where one side arms, the other side arms against it, and, the, and it, can, it eventually spirals out of control. I think it's possible, I believe it's possible to get off of that, that highway. I think you can escape the security dilemma. So I would say I'm a realist. I think it's, it's an anarchic world, and states are going to behave as they do because they realize there's ultimately nobody telling them what to do. But I think that uh, I would classify myself, and I believe that this is an optimistic way of doing this as a, a defensive realist and somebody that believes that there are ways to reassure the other parties that you're not going to uh, try to uh, continue the security dilemma and, and ranch up. You can, you, can, you can take the exit ramp off as opposed to just being trapped by that dilemma. Um, there are others that think it's inescapable and that we're headed for uh, destruction. I just don't believe that. Um, the other thing I would say is uh, it's encouraging to me uh, that as uh, the Philippines and the United States are friends, uh, that we can have disagreements without being disagreeable. Um, and I think that the majority of uh, the state-level leadership in the Philippines and in the United States are certainly in that category. Uh, I do believe that President Duterte has got a learning curve, but you know what? I think our president does too. <laughs> and, and so I, I think if we start throwing rocks at that particular dynamic, we're going to have a hard time with ourselves. Uh, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Hey, I've got a learning curve too. I'm, I'm trying to live my life. It's, you know, it's a... It's a, it's a it's a, it's a learning process. But, but you really have to look at it like that. And the other thing I would say is that let's think about managing this as a global leader should, maturely. Manage. Don't try to solve it. Don't try to tell the other countries what to do. I think that's a mistake. Um, sometimes we have to use military force when there's no choice. And we're ready if we need to. Uh, but wh why should we... Why should, everybody knows that. Why should we brandish that? I'm, I'm, a, I'm optimistic. Uh, we're going to get through this. If I may, me read one quote, which I think is really important. Um, there's, there are two quotes I have. One is from uh, Sean Spicer, the current White House press secretary, at least today. Um, and, and, and so I, and that's, not a, that's not a pejorative statement. I'm just making it. It's a fact, right? Um, if, this is what he said on January 23rd, not long ago. If those islands in the South China Sea are, in fact, in international waters, so conditionally, and not part of China proper, we're going to make sure that we defend international territories from being taken over by one country. Now, I understand the sentiment, and I'm not, being, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to cast dispersions at his use of the language, but I do think it's important when you speak to an international audience to use specific words that mean specific things. And the term if those, international, if those islands are in fact in international waters and not part of China, it's probably better to defer the question um, thank, you're welcome, Sean. Um, and, then, and then, I like him, though, actually. He's, a, he's funny to watch. Um, <laughs> Wang, Wang Yi, I'm going to get in so much trouble for this. Uh, Wang, Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, said on February 6, 2017, even more recently, this is what he said, and I think this is, this is illustrative, too. Brush up on the history of World War II. In 1946, the then Chinese government, with help from the United States, openly and in accordance with law, took back the non Shah Islands, which they call the Spratlys, and reefs that Japan had occupied, and resumed exercising sovereignty. Afterwards, certain countries around China used illegal methods to occupy some of the non Shah Islands and reefs, and it is this that created the so-called South China Sea dispute. Now, the foreign minister of China is, in fact, the foreign minister of China and speaks with some authority. Um, that's what they believe. Uh, and I think that corresponds with this intellectual defense and historical defense of the nine dash line. I'm not suggesting that we agree with them, and I don't agree with them, but I am suggesting that these words, which are very specific, are worth paying attention to. And when we speak to them, we've got to be just as sure of our own words. I appreciate your attention. Thank you so much.